Happy Sunday, my friends. I don't need these right now. Um, I'm Susu, and um, my dogs Buster and Boo Boo are here. You can see Buster that way. <laughs> and um, we are Susu and the Wolfman. I have decided that I want to revisit the poet and the pendulum because we learned about Nightwish a little over a year ago, and we did that video very early on, before we knew the history of the band, before we fell in love with all of them and, and came to appreciate them. And so I've been doing some documentary reactions uh, and watching some on my own as well lately. And I think this is a good thing to do before uh, The Poet and the Pendulum. It's uh, five short videos, one after the other, um, that are given um, by Tuimus um, interviews. Uh, and I believe this is shortly after um, the band let go of Tarya when he was maybe in the midst of his depression. I'm not sure yet. Um, the, it says Face Culture 2007, um, but that's not obviously the year that this was filmed. Uh, most of them just say 12 years ago for a date. So I guess I don't really need the exact date. I just know when it was in the band's evolution. And I know he went through a very dark period because I watched um, the documentary about him, Mon, Mon Mania. <laughs> Sorry, I can't pronounce it correctly. Uh, Mon, M-A-I-N-I-O-T. And that was really good and touching and sad and it just gave a really good look into Tuimus' life, and um, he's human like the rest of us, and, you know, things happen, and your world gets turned upside down sometimes, so um, I'm interested in watching this, and I hope you'll watch it with me. Right. I'm going to have to do five videos, because that's the way that it's um, put out on YouTube, so I'm just going to do one, maybe say a few things, go on to the next. Um, so I can discover more about this genius, poet, maestro, amazing man. Okay, so let's start with the first one. If I open your website now, there is an image and, there's, and then there is, is a line. Time for one more daring dream. Mm -hmm. How do you look back on the first one, the first dream? <laughs> Ah, uh, <laughs> actually, that's just a line from the song Eva. Uh, Time for one more daring dream. But you can, well, you can interpret it. You can, yeah, you can. But this is the way I see it. Okay. So it's just a line from this little girl's mouth who is being mocked at school, and uh, she's. Mm -hmm planning to do something bad for herself, but she still has time for one more daring dream. One more daring dream. Yeah, that's what I meant by it, but uh, like you said, it can be <coughs> interpreted in so many different ways. Yeah. And, um, well, I was wondering now, it's been three or four years uh, since your previous album. Um, what are your memories about once? Uh, it's, it's three or four years, a lot of things uh, have happened. How do you look back on the album music-wise? I'm still really proud of it. I mean, I wouldn't change a note, still. Mm -hmm. uh, that was the band at its best in 2004. And when we got it done, we were really happy with it. We're still really happy with it. The tour following that, especially the year 2004, was a lot of fun. I think it was the best time the band had ever had until that moment. So I look, at, look back at those times with just positive thoughts. Okay. And um, how was it? Well, I have to ask, of course, um, do you have any regrets then maybe about the open letter to Taya, or was it? I don't have any regrets, no. I mean, we, s we get this question a lot, yeah, believe yeah. me. Yeah. And I also understand that people <coughs> As outsiders, they see it their own way. They see it in a really cruel way and all mm. that. But um, first of all, I don't really want to talk about the whole thing anymore. For me, it's ancient history. 
And the other thing is that there are so many details involved in everything that happened, in everything, why we acted in the way that we did, that people don't know about. And it's actually none of their business either, so mm. maybe it's better that everybody would just shut up about the whole thing. <laughs> okay. It's, uh, but y you would still do the same? Yeah. Okay, no, that's good. Um, and was it too and, Yeah, mm -hmm. I still want to emphasize is that uh, everything that ever happened was like a democratic decision. I have just like been the spokesman or the messenger for the band. So the only thing that I kind of regret is that uh, the focus has been maybe a bit too much just to myself because, yeah. I mean, the letter and the decision, everything was done by the four guys in the band. But since I'm kind of like the main character in the band, I ended up being the spokesman. Was it hard then for you? I mean, afterwards, the first year after, uh, after she left, was it hard more on you than on the other members of the band because you were more into the limelight or? Uh, yeah, that was the hardest part of it, like dealing with the media and dealing with the hassle. This had to be very difficult for him because everyone's blaming him, but it was a decision by everybody is what he's saying. And um, I believe him, but they, like they say, don't kill the messenger. It sounds like they were trying to kill the messenger and he's tired of talking about it and I don't blame him. But uh, I considered it as like taking responsibility and kind of like doing my job because I felt the responsibility to explain and being out in the public. But uh, all the time I was like speaking for the whole band. Still am. Yeah, that had to be difficult. And I know he had to get tired of talking about it for sure. It looks a little shy, too. Okay, now we're going to go on to part two. Any, any thoughts that you had maybe that, that it was the end of the band? Or was you just determined to go on? Or did you ever think, well, maybe this is the end? I, I never, never. Not mm. for a microsecond. I guess there, were, there was a bit too much pride left <laughs> still. But I know... Um, was for you, um, well, you, you, you uh, I think in 2005 you had the highest hopes, the best of CD. Was it fun to make the selection for the songs? All this compilation thing, all these different versions of the albums, different versions of the singles, I just consider them being like a contemporary record label business. I mean, I'm not a big fan of compilations either. So it's just like record labels do what they need to do. And uh, it's... So you weren't involved then in... in well, I was involved in picking up the songs. Somebody yeah. from the label made the suggestions and I kind of like approved. Okay. But uh, at the same time, all of my focus was just finding the new singer and uh, um, making the songs for the new album. And did you know uh, when you were uh, well, starting to look for a new singer. Um, did you, did you all, all already have something in mind? Someone, some sound, or was it just, well, we'll just see what happened? The only thing that uh, we knew at that point was that uh, none of the guys in the band, we didn't want to have another similar singer to Tarja. We did not want to have another classically trained operatic singer. How come, why not? Because we thought that uh, Tarja did her thing so well she was really, really good at what she did with her singing performance and interpretation in her own way. But there w wouldn't be anybody on the planet who would do it equally good. And even if she w would have been really good, she would have always been considered like a cheap copycat of Tarja. So we just felt that uh, the fairest thing to do was to find somebody who would sing in a completely different way, but uh, who would still have the power and the emotion. This is very interesting to me because when he said this, he didn't even have Floor on the radar, I believe, um, because he went to Annette next and he didn't want another classically trained operatic singer. But then 
later on flora comes along and she brings it because she can do the operatic and the rock and roll so that's really cool i know annette is next and did you know where to look was it well uh did it have to be someone from finland or it didn't matter we had no emphasis of the nationality of we just had an open audition we received about 2,000 demos from wow. 55 different countries and uh, out of those 2,000 we met in person about 10 girls wow. Annette being one of them. And I heard that she was one of the first people to send in? Yeah, her demo came like in November or December 2005 already and it really made an impact on all of us. Can you, be, can you explain what you, well, you, you played her, her song? What do you think? Can you, can you still recall? What was the thing? Yeah, that? she sent her demo. It was just the song Ever Dream from the album Center a Child. And I was like, okay, there comes another demo. And I just put in a CD player. And uh, I was like, wow, this sounds good. I listened to it again. This sounds really, really good. And what really like uh, caught my attention was that uh, she had the most natural sound in her voice in the whole world. There was not the slightest bit of like made up uh, traumatic decoration in the voice. Mm. It, it was not the most distinctive sound in the whole world. You know what I mean? It's not the most special voice in the world. Like for example, the singer of Cranberries has, for example. But uh, it just felt so natural, so warm, so down to earth that uh, I got immediately interested. And then I played the song to the other guys in the band and they were, wow, this is really good. So it kind of set the standards for all the rest to come. But uh, since we were not in any hurry, we already had decided at that point that uh, we need to find the singer until the end of January 2007. So we had over a year. So I just contacted her saying that, uh, thank you for the demo, it's really good, we'll keep in touch. Did you know her already, her, her band? Or? No, never heard of her never before. Heard, okay. okay. Well, that was interesting. The way they found Annette. I noticed that he is not extremely comfortable in front of the camera on one-on-ones at least he wasn't back then and probably because they keep asking him the same questions and one thing he said is you know some of it will never be known because it's just nobody's business and you know what that's true i mean they're in the public eye but you know they're people and they don't want all of their I wouldn't say dirty laundry, but all of, I wouldn't want all of my stuff rehashed for the whole public and continue to answer questions about it. So I can understand that. All right, this is part three. And um, well, then you, well, well, you said you, 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 10 people came, came by to see mm -hmm. you. Um, was it hard to make a decision? Was it, and did you maybe thought, well, we have three good singers now and we have to I'm not going to go draws. too much into the details, okay. but uh, let's say there were a lot of really nice girls, really nice voices, but uh, in the end it was just a matter of listening to your own heart. And when we sat together as a band, we were just talking about the different candidates and just something clicked and the heart told us really strongly that Annette is the one. That's the best way to explain it. Okay. And then, well, the music. Um, when did you start writing for this new album? <clears throat> it's really hard to say the concrete exact date because, like, writing songs is a way of life and you're thinking about them all the time. I'm already writing songs for the next album that will come out in 2010 or something. <laughs> so it's a way of life. But uh, um, the concrete process of putting all the ideas together started at the end of 2005. And uh, I finished all the 15 songs within the period of four months. Wow. So it was really creative time for me. I've never done songs so quickly. So you were really eager to yeah, there the was pride, a lot of the pride you still... 
I don't know, maybe? Yeah, I think it has to do with the fact that there was a lot of drama in the air, yeah. a lot of frustration, sadness, mm -hmm. and uh, all the bittersweet feelings, what happened. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was very, very sad. And the only way I could kind of like escape from all that was to go into the world of those 15 songs. Can you, can you describe the world for me? <coughs> the 15 songs? Is, is there one world or are there more? It's one world with the 15 individual stories. But that's kind of <coughs> where I found the comfort. Mm, it, everything that happened like with the media, it was a huge punch into the face with oh. a sledgehammer. I, I was really childish and naive not to expect it to happen. I didn't think that we would be such an interesting band. <laughs> but uh, suddenly it was everywhere. So it was really hard times. But uh, I just like, I closed the TV and closed the phone and yeah. started to concentrate on the songs and it really helped. Mm -hmm. And I think that's also the main reason why the album ended up being quite so dark and heavy because the feelings weren't the best possible at that time. Is there one song that you, well, that you, can you describe, is, is, is there maybe one song is more of the center of the album, maybe the backbone of few songs? Sometimes people say, well, when I write an album, then there are certain starting points or backbones of the album, or is it just 15 songs have the same feeling? No, it's a very diverse feeling throughout the whole album. <clears throat> Uh, I think this is the most diverse album we have ever done. It uh, includes the heaviest song we ever did. It includes the longest song we ever did. Maybe the most in intimate song we ever did. So the extremes are really present. And for me personally, the highlight of the whole album is already the first song, The Poet and the Pendulum, which is the 14 minute song. After that, it kind of eases up a little. I didn't know that he was going to say that when I started doing this um, as part of my Poet and the Pendulum lead up. So that's awesome. A little bit with the more direct songs and then it starts to get really interesting at song number seven, which is called Sahara. And mm -hmm. then the Celtic influence is coming at song number 10 and then comes down to the ultimate ending of Meadows of Heaven. We already, I mean, <laughs> if you write the songs, you already know then what the structure will be on the album? No, not at that point. Okay. Once they're finished. Yeah. Okay, I'm thoroughly enjoying this, um, but I have to say, the guy that's interviewing him irritates me a little bit. I don't, I don't know why. I, I think he sometimes asks questions the wrong way. He's not reading Thomas's, he's just reading straight from the, whatever his script is. But anyway, we're getting the information, so good. It's the next one. Um, what the album's called, you already said it, it's, it's dark, album dark, patient play. Um, when did you came up with the name for the album? Were the songs finished or was it? Yeah, it was a pretty late invention because the album was supposed to be called The Poet and the Pendulum for a long time. Oh. But uh, then just didn't feel just right. I don't know, maybe it was too long or I can't remember what was going on. But then it just popped to me that Dark Passion Play, that's like the three words to describe what the album is about the best. Dark, we already mentioned. Passion. passion yeah, music, music is all about passion. Mm -hmm. Positive or negative passion. Mm -hmm. And play, I mean, the music is just one big theater play, yeah. especially this album. And that's not everybody, though. His music is a play <clears throat> but, um, and a story, but not all music is. That's what makes him so special to me. But it also holds a double meaning, like passion play is Christ. what Christ went through on the cross. It's called passion play. 
So if you want to think about it in a really, really dark way, it's dark passion play. Is it for you? Uh, you can interpret it in no, any ways you want. Okay, but this last one, uh, was it something that you that you had, uh, that you, that, well, was that a meaning for you or was it something that afterwards you thought, hey, you can also see it in a Christ passion play way? Yeah, it's a symbolic thing. I mean... Yeah. No, but did you know when you, when you, when you, when you came up with a title or just afterwards that everything f fell into place? Yeah, you everything know? just fell into place. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, uh, the song Bye Bye Beautiful is about Taya. Was it hard to write that song or was it a relief to write the song? This is the reason why I have become a songwriter in my life. I need to drill a hole into my head to let all the demons out. Mm -hmm. So this song just needed to be done because I was feeling so bad about everything. And it still is a huge part of my life, everything would happen, so of course I needed to do a song about what happened. And I hope nobody gets offended by this song because it's not a song about hatred at all. It sounds maybe a bit more aggressive than the meaning behind the song actually is. For me it's just like a farewell. It's a song about frustration, and bittersweet feelings. It's a song about a really sad happening where nobody in the end was ever innocent. Mm -hmm. If you have to pick one nice memory about a time with her, what, what comes to your mind? Is there one, one... You're really cutting the wounds here. <laughs> I know, right? No, it's okay. But yeah, there were really, really good times. A lot. I mean, I remember the year 2004, after the release of the album and the Beginning, beginning of the tour following that was really good times. Was it, I think it was the North American tour? Or was it? Yeah, the North American tour, yes. There was a European tour in the fall, yeah. which was really nice with Sonata Arctica and Timor Rautia. And there were good times. Man, he won't stop drilling him, and you see how uncomfortable he is. And I know that's part of being in the limelight, but as a mom and a sister and just a protective person in general for people that I care about or have empathy for, I don't like this interviewer. This is for you because, well, um, after, the, after the one film and the other song, uh, Wish I Had an Angel, um, you were really, uh, well, conquering America. Um, what do you hope for now? What, what is for you? Do you, do you think, well, uh, you will pick up where you left? Or do you think you still have something to prove now with the new single? What are your thoughts on well, forthcoming months and year? What does he mean you have something to prove? Do you, I mean, all he has to say is, are you going to pick up where you left off? Or are you guys going to... I don't know. Sorry. Sorry for my protectiveness. I just really hope that uh, <clears throat> we will have a really, really good time as a band, as a group on tour, so that we don't have to start writing any more stupid letters at the end of the tour. Yeah. And uh, everybody's learned from the mistakes. Um, and I hope people will have an open mind when it comes to the new album with the band being what it is these days with Annette as the new singer. And it's extremely exciting times. I feel that anything can happen now. Mm -hmm. I mean, we can go down the train big time. We can keep the same level. We can go even higher. Mm -hmm. So the world is totally open, which is a kind of fascinating thing. It's a bit scary, especially for her. Yeah. I hope people will have the courtesy of treating her very enough. But uh, we just have to wait and see and do our best. What do you think? What is your gut feeling now? What does it tell you? Will it be the same more or? The only thing I know for sure that it's going to be really divided. There's going to be people cheering and there's going to be a lot of rotten eggs thrown to the stage. But I think <laughs> the first reaction were really good. I mean, the first reaction in Finland. 
Yeah, it's been really good. And uh, so maybe, maybe, but uh, it's also a really good thing not to think about those things in advance. Yeah, get all in your head. It's no use. So yeah. I'm not gonna gamble at all. Okay. Just have to wait and see. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. He has the sweetest smile, but it also looks a little bit uh, shy and withdrawn, which is a a true um, tell that somebody's genius, because they can't connect with everybody else in the world the way other people do sometimes, because they are so gifted and talented that they see things in a completely different light than most people and then that leaves you feeling very lonely um which you know it's that's something that happened has happened and still happens to musical geniuses and other types of geniuses um but this was really interesting and it doesn't take me up to please learn the set list in 48 hours but um I can see what's going to come after this because I know Annette was with them and then she was sick and Floor came in. Um, so, wow. And I think this is good groundwork, um, almost ready to react to the poet and the pendulum. Um, about ready. But I want to make sure I catch everything that I can beforehand. And you know, when I first learned of Nightwish, I didn't think much of Tuomas. I mean, he was always in the back with his um, keyboards and he looked pretty cool, you know, nice looking guy, just, but I didn't realize how integral everything is to him. I didn't know that he wrote every song. I didn't know these symphonies with this poetry. His lyrics are genius. Um, I remember one time years ago, um, I had been a, and still am a big Beatles fan, and one of my uncles said, well, their lyrics are genius. Um, and I was surprised that he even thought that, because he's pretty old fashioned to like the Beatles. And then uh, when I went to college, uh, one of the Beatles songs was in my poetry book. So um, you can take them apart and they're just rich with meaning, and that's exactly what anything that Tuomas does is. Writes whatever he orchestrates, just rich and packed um, with meaning. So I uh, hope you guys liked watching this with me. I, I'm really, I watched, um, you know, that other um, documentary, Mon Mano, and it let me know a lot about what happened with him uh, right after the events of the letter and um, how he came to write The Poet and the Pendulum and some other things. But this is even more up close and personal. Um, I do not like the interviewer. <laughs> I think Thomas was being so gracious and trying to do his best, but there were times when you could just see him go, really, really dude, you're gonna go there again? So anyway, um, thank you guys for tuning in. And uh, if you have any other comments about um, Tumas and the band and, uh, that you want to tell me, I may already know them, I may not. Uh, it's been about a year, so I'm getting to know a lot. Um, so if you liked my video, please give me a thumbs up and share it with your friends. Um, subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. It's usually me and the Wolfman. Oh, there's one of our other dogs, Boo Boo, walking behind me. And um, comment down below, share, subscribe. Uh, uh, we have a PayPal button for donations to our channel and be blessed until I see you again. Sometimes my outros are a little bit bumpy.